Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the break and were able to talk with someone you didn't already know. That's the beauty of City Lab, the opportunity to share ideas, solutions, and challenges with new people. Now, on to our next panel. Battling Opioids, Lessons from the Front Lines. Please welcome Nicole Alexander Scott, Director of the Rhode Island Department of Health. Michael Botticelli, Executive Director of the Graykin Center for Addiction Medicine at Boston Medical Center, and also a Senior Policy Scholar at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. Leanna Wen, Commissioner of Health for the City of Baltimore. Josh Sharfstein, Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And please welcome back to the stage the Atlantic's Allison Stewart. So if you picked up a newspaper, for us old folks who read newspapers, or read on the internet um, today, you've probably seen that the commission created by President Trump to battle the health crisis of opioids requested that the president declare a state of emergency around this issue. Uh, the report was about 10 pages long, was full of some very startling statistics, many that the people on this panel know, of course, that opioids now kill nearly 150 Americans every day. Uh, one headline that did stand out to me with regards to this panel is the one that said, Trump's opioid commission listened to public health experts. So we have public health experts here. Um, we, we decided to use first names because we were hoping to have a, more of a conversation. Lena, as Baltimore City's health commissioner, when it came to approaching this epidemic, specifically with Baltimore's challenges in mind, what did you decide were the two or three priorities you were going to focus on, and what points you wanted to pursue? Why those specific points? There is huge stigma around the disease of addiction. People don't understand addiction in the same way that we understand diabetes or heart disease, which is that it is a disease that can kill that there are treatments that work, that exist, that there are millions of people in recovery. So we decided that we were going to focus first and foremost on the idea, the importance of saving lives. So we said, we're first going to get naloxone or Narcan, the antidote, into the hands of every single resident in our city. We got the legislation changed and I issued a blanket prescription to every single person in our city. 620,000 residents, that's kind of a lot of, of prescriptions and, um, uh, and, and things to issue. But um, as a result of our aggressive outreach efforts with our partners across the city, everyday residents have saved over a thousand lives in the last two years alone. And that for us is changing the mentality. And then we're focused on increasing access to treatment, as well as changing the perception, the understanding of addiction as a criminal justice issue, starting initiatives like the law enforcement, uh, the law, uh, the uh, starting LEAD, the law enforcement program, um, so that we're able to divert individuals who would otherwise be in arrest or incarceration, but instead getting them into treatment. Nicole. When you first took office, took your position, I should say, in 2015, hospitals had a very different way of dealing with people who came in who overdosed. A lot has changed in two years. Tell us a little bit about what's changed in Rhode Island. We've been able to partner with the hospitals. We have 13 in Rhode Island, and we've recognized that hospitals are the hub. It's the one place where you know that there's going to be a touch point with people who are struggling with substance use disorder. So that's really a key place for us as a state and for the communities and for others throughout the nation to really be able to target getting services to the people who are most in need whether they come in for suspected overdose or um, recently recovering from an overdose or someone at risk of an overdose. So in, in working with hospitals who understood this but needed some help in making sure that there was a consistent level of care provided for all patients, we issued um, a levels of care sort of standards document uh, that you could go to our website, health.ri.gov, and search levels of care and see. We have three levels, and um, we recently, with uh, our governor, uh, Gina Raimondo, signing an executive order, charged every hospital with fulfilling at least the um, minimum level of care um, to provide standard care for people with substance use disorder. 
What's included on that um, is an opportunity to make sure that naloxone is dispensed, to make sure that screening for substance use disorder is done for every patient, those that come in with an ankle sprain or um, um, an upset stomach should be tested because that is a key place where we can really reach people and get them engaged in treatment. We also want to make sure that they have access to a peer recovery coach, someone who um, has lived and is thriving in the life of recovery um, that's able to come alongside someone and um, help them change their life and save lives. Um, and we are also testing for fentanyl, which we know is um, a severe element of this epidemic that is really causing um, the, uh, the dangers and the deaths that are occurring. So to the extent that we can test for it and respond to it, um, those are just a few of the components that we're including within the levels of care. And that works all the way up to the topmost level, which is getting people right then and there started on medication-assisted treatment. Um, and the long-term, beginning the long-term recovery process on MAT and with all of the supports that they need um, to live a healthy life and to prevent um, deaths. So hospitals have embraced this. We're working with them now, and we're expecting that every hospital will be at one of those levels of care. So we've talked city, we've talked state. Let's talk education with you, Josh. What are some of the innovations that are happening at Johns Hopkins to help address this crisis? So uh, with the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, we are partnering with organizations and their staff. We're providing public health training to some fantastic people every year um, to help them apply the tools of public health, looking at data, looking at what's effective, learning from uh, Lena and Nicole and other really great innovators out there and bring it to their communities. We'll be partnering with upwards of um, maybe 40 or 50 communities at a time uh, working on these different projects. We're also uh, using the research capacity we have to kind of push the envelope. Um, Nicole mentioned fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is incredibly potent, very lethal. It's gone from almost off the radar screen to the majority of deaths on the East Coast. There's something new going on with this crisis, and we have to think, well, what new can we bring to the table, and what are the kinds of innovations that might work? And cities are looking at things like supervised consumption areas or testing um, in the field for fentanyl, things that you know maybe are a little bit edgy. Well, it's a question if they work because this is a new challenge, we should be bringing new solutions. So we're, we would like to be part of that uh, conversation and help people um, identify new tools for success. Shouldn't we be a little edgy at this point? Uh, well, I absolutely think we should. And I think part of the challenge that people, and this is reflecting um, you know, these underlying issues of stigma that Lena mentioned, is that people have a very fixed attitude on addiction. They sort of, a lot of people just know what, you know, it's, it's a law enforcement issue or it's a moral issue. And part of the, you know, rising to the challenge of this is to take a step back and say, well, maybe we don't know everything. We have to look, we have to think about what can make a difference, and we have to judge whether it works by the outcome and not by our preconceived notions. Now, Michael, I saved you for last because <laughs> uh -oh. you've worked That's at the local plan. level, the state level, at the federal level as the White House Officer of the National Drug Control Policy. I want to say that right, I didn't quite. Um, You've worked at uh, Massachusetts Public Health for 18 years. You're now at Johns Hopkins. Having worked in all these different areas with this one issue, um, can you sort of link together how all these different entities could work together in concert and not be in silos? So I think, you know, in particular work at the federal level, I think acknowledge the strong role that partnerships between the federal government, state government, and local government played in terms of, one, making sure that um, we were doing everything we could from a policy standpoint to make sure that states and locals had adequate resources to respond, as, as well as one of the things that I think we did uh, well was what, what I call scout and scale. Right, so federal government is not known for innovation and speed. And so part of what we would do is what I call scout and scale. So if we were having a particular issue or wanted to highlight what a state or a city could do, we often turn to the people on my left and right here to promote what they were doing uh, um, at that level. But, but I think you know, what is perhaps most 
in instrumental in terms of our federal role is really rooting this as a public health issue. And if you look at the history of federal drug control spending, the vast majority of those dollars were spent on historic law enforcement approaches. And you know, I'm happy to say that under the Obama administration, as we left, unfortunately that's no longer the case, that what we spent on public health approaches equaled what we spent on law enforcement approaches. We were hoping that that trajectory would uh, continue, um, but unfortunately with the president's proposed budget, we see a divergence again and back to a much more of a law enforcement focus. But, but you know, and, and I think that, you know, what we acknowledge is that we all have a role to play and that the federal government in partnerships with state and locals, in partnership with public health and public safety, that we all really needed to work together, look at the data and evidence, make sure we were focusing on our strategies on what worked and kind of, you know, doing away with what didn't work um, to really make changes um, as it related to the trajectory of this epidemic. Lena, you mentioned naloxone and the prescription you wrote. Most people, a lot of people know it as Narcan. Uh, why is it controversial? You know you have people who say that people are just going to go out and use again once you revive them. <laughs> it is, so I, I want to address that because it is important that we address these myths, right? I think those of us who are here, especially many of you in Baltimore who are here, I see a lot of our partners in the audience from OSI Baltimore, from Behavioral Health System Baltimore, all, all of our amazing partners who've been in this effort. I know that we are on the same page and yet we hear these stigmatizing comments all the time. I wonder if we would ever say to someone who is dying from a peanut allergy, their throat is closing, would we ever say to them, I'm not gonna give you an EpiPen because it just might make you eat peanuts next time. Mm. We would never consider doing that. It's stigmatizing, it's wrong, and yet we have this deep-rooted belief that there is something different about addiction. Somehow it's a choice, and therefore if we see it as a choice, it's a moral failing, and therefore, if you die, if you end up in jail, it is your fault. This is the same thing, actually. There are other types of misconceptions, too, like around medication-assisted treatment. We know that it works. We know that, based on best scientific evidence, that this is important for us to, this, it's important for us to promote it and have this available. But there are people who will say, and we actually heard Secretary Tom Price say this, that using methadone or buprenorphine is, quote, replacing one addiction with another which I would argue, do we ever say to somebody who has diabetes, why are you still on insulin? Why can't you just get off of it and be done with it, right? And so this is why fighting stigma with science, using data, using the public health approach is so critical in our fight against addiction. I know you've spoken a lot about data, I mean, about stigma, Michael. Um, when is it actually an obstacle to getting policy passed? So, so stigma plays a role both at the individual and the policy level, right? So when you look at data, we know that only a small proportion of people who actually need treatment get it. And when you ask people who even know they have a problem why they're not seeking treatment, they will often talk about fear that their employer will find out, um, that their neighbors will find out. So, and it really, we know that it um, uh, often um, manifests itself in people delaying or avoiding care but it also manifests itself on the policy level, right? And so I think that's why we've seen this over-reliance on punitive approaches mm -hmm. uh, to this issue. Um, actually, studies that Johns Hopkins have done have shown that uh, people believe that people with a substance use disorder are less deserving of a treatment benefit, are less deserving the housing and employment opportunities. And, you know, I'm, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and, uh, you know, and part of my, what, and I'm very public about it, and I encourage other people to be public about it, because, you know, we've known this has been a disease for a long time. And I always say science and data are insufficient to drive public policy. People drive public policy. And we've seen with other stigmatized diseases and other stigmatized people that our ability to come out and it can often change people's minds and change our neighbors' minds and influence public policy. So, so I think it's really important because in this issue, we know what works here. We, we don't need new diagnostics about the problem. And, and part of it is, do we have the will and do we have the leadership to do it? And, and it, it often comes from the fact that people with addiction are seen as less deserving of the kinds of care that we give other people on a routine basis. When we talk about public perception, Nicole, you had a, an interesting um, situation in Rhode Island, um, and I'm going to try to be careful with my language here because I don't want to offend anyone or hurt anyone. The CEO of Hasbro, Hasbro Toys, 
son died of an overdose. And the parents, his parents were very vocal, they were angry, they had quite a bit of grief, and they were expressing it very publicly. They have since become, I want to say since become, they are allies in the fight. Can you tell me a little bit about navigating that situation, how you were able to have them come and be a forceful ally? Those parents have really become uh, ambassadors, almost. Um, and in, in such a, a challenging situation, being able to turn that into an opportunity. Um, we were able to um, have them re represent uh, the fact that preventable deaths are occurring, and there are changes that we need to do at the community level, the local level, the state level, and nationally to address them. Um, and they were a big part of the impetus for the emergency department and hospital uh, levels of care standards that I referred to earlier. We were able to um, support them uh, in their grief um, and then also work with them as partners because they were very engaged in wanting to make sure that a difference occurred, that we were able to um, use the um, memory of their son's life to prevent the loss of future lives. And we were able to use that to inform policy. There have been a number of legislations that have resulted, in, including our Rhode Island um, discharge planning law, which is captured in the levels of care, and the name um, is included in the His law. Name, yeah. Um, and they are active members of our Governor Raimondo's Overdose Prevention and Intervention Task Force now. And as a result of that, we're also um, ro ramping up a prevention campaign that we are developing a family task force to work with us to oversee and really get the message out and make sure that their voices are heard. This is an um, appreciation of our governor who, who wanted to make sure that the voices of those that have gone through these painful tragedies can be heard and help inform how we address this differently and get the attention that's needed. This is a critical epidemic. We need everyone involved at the city level, at the local level, at the neighborhood level to, to do something differently so that we can save lives. Josh, I know that you are um, an active consumer of news and you write op-eds and you write pieces. What have you seen reported or misreported about this issue that you really think needs to be corrected? How much time do we have? 11.18. <laughs> um, okay. All right. No, no. 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 So, five minutes. So the, 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 there are a few um, the big, ma the major really challenges, big. but I will pick one um, when, and I will say it has to do with uh, babies. I'm a pediatrician. and. A neonatal abstinence syndrome is uh, sort of the withdrawal symptoms that babies can experience if they're born to um, a mom who was taking opioids in one form or another. And there is really a raft of stories about the poor baby who is born with a few days of withdrawal symptoms, and sometimes they even have like super slow-mo on the withdrawal symptoms and all focused on the baby. But what they don't show in that picture is the mom. And they miss the fact that one of the most important things for that baby, probably the most important thing, is that the mom does well and the mom is treated and the mom's treated with respect and without stigma and gets into the services that she needs so that the mom and baby can move forward in life together with you know, everyone else in the family. And the reason that that's important is because there are some babies that have neonatal abstinence syndrome because the mom is in treatment, because the mom is receiving methadone or buprenorphine right. in treatment. And by just looking at the baby, you miss a huge difference between the, the, the parents who are in a situation that is incredibly dangerous for the child of you know, uh, illicit drug use and the situation where the parents are really doing exactly what we want them to do and putting their lives back together. As a pediatrician, I used to be able to tell, just walking down the hall in the nursery, you know, it could be if the, the mom was on heroin, you'd have social services there, it would be all this drama at the bedside. And if the mom had been a stable patient in a methadone program with all the services, you know, the most devoted parent. 
thanking God for getting, having a baby. And if we just narrow in and use terms that are just wrong, like the baby's addicted, the baby's not addicted, the baby has a few days of withdrawal symptoms, mm -hmm. if, we, if we overly focus on that, we wind up punishing the mom, pushing her off of treatment that could save her life and frankly be absolutely critical for the baby. Allison, can I jump in here Absolutely. for a minute? So one of the other ways that I think the media can be helpful, I'll frame it positively, is changing the language that they use in reference to addiction, right? So um, media still uses words like addict and junkie, calling people in recovery clean, um, when you think about what the opposite of that is. And actually, the AP Style Guide mm -hmm. just came out with a whole series of language changes around addiction. And if you think of the language that we don't use anymore when we, in referring to people with mental illnesses, that we still use for addiction. And research has actually shown us that the language that we use oh, yeah. actually factors into how people are treated and stigmatizing views. So like, I, I think the media has a responsibility not only about good scientific reporting, but, but if I read one more time Time, like I, what I think is well-intentioned reporters who are referring people as addicts, I want to say, like, didn't you get the memo? Mm -hmm. that, like, the, and so I think it's actually a really low-hanging, simple thing mm -hmm. that we can do and that the media can do to do a better, accurate, non-stigmatizing portrayal to people with addictive disorders. Can I add one more as well? Maybe we're all piling on because <laughs> of media. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's, um, I read in the news a lot, too, about how we don't know what works. And so let's let's look for other solutions or let's look for detox options and let's look at all these. I mean, we actually know based on science. The science itself is clear. Yes, we do need more pain management strategies, more prevention strategies, but when someone has an opioid addiction, we know what works, a combination of medication-assisted treatment, psychosocial counseling, and other services. We know what works. We just need the resources to get there. And I think the more that we can focus on the lack of resources, it would be helpful. You know, we, there's a lot of rhetoric out there, um, a lot of rhetoric, and I'm glad that the conversation has been changing so that we are now seeing addiction as a disease, which, by the way, when it only affected black and brown people, maybe we didn't quite see addiction as a disease, but in any case, we, we address that. Still, now the overall conversation has changed so that we are talking about getting treatment. But if we're talking about solving any other epidemic, if this were Ebola, that we're killing hundreds of people a day, we would not stand by and say, let's just switch to block grants. Forget about Medicaid to solve, to pay for uh, other diseases. Forget the fact that one in three of our patients receiving substance use disorder or who are getting treatment for this are on Medicaid. I mean, we would never accept the tiny amount of funding that's allocated for substance use disorder for any other illness. So that's what I hope the media can focus on. Why we don't talk about that there is a solution, we just have to have the willpower Funded. and the money to get there. I want to let people know, I'm going to ask one more question. If you have any questions for our panel, please, there will be folks in these two aisles with microphones. Um, just in the course of, of talking about this and covering the story for a couple of years and talking to smart people like you, one thing that's come up to me, I think, has this has morphed and this has changed and just from, opioids is almost too big a, t a subject because you have people who have prescriptions for acute pain, you have people who have it for chronic pain, then you have people who are addicted to heroin, and then you have fentanyl. It's just become more than one thing. Should we be thinking about it that way when we talk about how to stem the crisis? I, this is open for anyone about how it has morphed and what do we do now that it is a four-headed, five-headed beast. I would say we definitely need um, a multi-pronged effort. Mm -hmm. The um, morphing that you refer to is very real. Uh, Josh mentioned earlier that um, before uh, 2012 in Rhode Island in particular, um, less than 10% of overdoses had fentanyl involved. For 2016, it was approaching 70% of cases that had fentanyl uh, involved. Uh, so we have to be able to adapt, and it requires multiple approaches based on the community. For your point about how to approach acute versus chronic, um, we decided to um, make sure we were specific in our language of limiting prescriptions of opioids to those who are um, receiving pain management for an acute 
pain scenario. That is the right time to make sure that you either don't start someone on opioids or you um, limit how much you use. That's different from someone who is already on opioids chronically and likely has developed tolerance or even addiction to it. That community, we still want to move towards getting off of opioids, but it should not be done in the abrupt way that you would just take someone off, sim similar to how Lena mentioned earlier, if someone has diabetes, you wouldn't just take them off of insulin. Plus, that increases the risk of then transitioning to illicit use. So at a policy level, we wanted to be careful that we're not just saying cut everyone off of opioids because we distinguished the, those who are dealing with acute pain versus those who are dealing with chronic pain. Anyone else? I, I, I will say, I think like many epidemics, I think we're like in the third wave of this epidemic, mm -hmm. right? So um, started with largely prescription drugs and we saw prescription, you know, uh, morbidity and mortality, and then we saw heroin kind of come in, and then now it's fentanyl. Um, and I do think that we need to continue to, uh, you know, monitor the epidemic in terms of, of the drugs and who it's affecting and continue to iterate strategies on it. But, but, but also, I think we still need to kind of pay attention to some, like part of the issue that I think, um, unfortunately, with heroin and fentanyl is that it overshadows the, that we still have an overprescribing problem in the United States, mm -hmm. right? So even though prescriptions have gone down, we are still prescribing at three times the rate that we were in 1990. So even though it's morphed and we have to think of new strategies, it's still, we're still dealing with some of the early uh, causes of this epidemic. And so I still think, you know, to Nicole's point, we, you need this multifaceted comprehensive response. I think we have a question here, sir. Uh, oh, my name's Taylor Branch. I'm a journalist. Uh, I want to speak to bad journalism and ask you to give us a theory before we get bad journalism on the question that I think is on a lot of people's mind. What are the causes of this? Where did fentanyl come from? And if we watch television and all the ads we see are for drugs, to what degree is, is that a cause of it? You say the prescriptions are down, but they're up you know, since 1999. Where, where did this come from so that we can get it from you before we get a bad theory from journalism? <laughs> you want to take? Go for it. You know, there is um, it's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, when I think about my own medical practice, I'm ashamed to admit that I'm part of the problem. I didn't learn in medical school and in residency, really, until I think I was, it was, I was in my last year of residency. I don't think I quite recognized what I was doing. I was prescribing opioids to people who were coming in with dental pain and back pain. I mean, this is what we did. It, part of it is misleading advertising from drug companies. Mm -hmm. Part of it is the medical culture. Part of it is actually our American culture, too, when there is a pill for every pain. You fall down, you sprain your ankle, somehow we say we gotta, it's our job to take away your pain. Doctors wanna make people feel better. And because we don't have other alternatives or we're taught that we don't have other alternatives, we end up prescribing opioids as the first step rather than saying rest or pain may be okay. You don't have to take away pain by taking opioids. There is a side effect. There is the possibility of addiction. There is the likelihood of overdose. I mean, I never really learned about that or thought about that. That is changing and working with hospitals, medical education experts. I mean, we are changing that so that there are now guidelines issued by the CDC. There, are, there is a change in the medical profession, but we do have to recognize that we are part of the problems ourselves as providers, as pharmaceutical companies, also as patients for promoting it as well. I'll add one more part of this too, which is that there was recently a study that looked at where it is that there's the highest rate of overdose. And they found that those particular areas also overlapped with the areas that voted in the highest numbers for President Trump. These are also areas that have the highest level of unemployment, unstable housing, and uncertain futures. And it begs the question, too, of what pain is it that we're treating? Maybe it's not just physical pain alone, something else, too. We, 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 uh, so we were actually having this discussion earlier in the day, and, and I do think... So uh, I, I heard someone say, Sam Quinones, who wrote this book called Dreamland about the epidemic, and I've heard him speak. Um, and Dreamland was this public park in uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, that went away, was paved over. And he has often said that the fundamental solution to our heroin epidemic is community. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I really believe that because I think there's something fundamentally happening. When we have diseases of despair, right? Suicide, overdoses, diseases around alcoholism, you know, contributing to a decrease in life expectancy in the United States, like we have a problem. And, and I think it's far deeper and I think it's rooted in people's isolation, in our lack of community cohesion, you know, in our love and care for one another. Like there's like something that I think we really need to focus on in terms of some of the underpinnings of what's happening in our communities that's leading to this. Okay, last word. Yeah, I was just saying, I think that ties together an event on cities because it's not just that you can have leadership on these very specific opioid issues, which you can, the medical community, the hospitals, stigma, but it's also the work that cities do to create communities that are very important to the opioid epidemic. Please thank our panel.